When I asked our next storyteller to tell us about a time that he was naughty and should have been nice, he said, I should not have brought illegal drugs into the country. <laughs> and then he followed up by saying, this was emphasized by a U.S. customs officer. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage, Kevin McGeehan. Come on up, Kevin. Hi. When I was 35 years old, I went home to live with my mother, Patty. Patty was a tiny little red-haired lady, just a sweet gal, uh, funny, intelligent, and she was a lovable eccentric who looked through the world, looked at the world through a crooked pair of rose-colored glasses. She was a single mother, divorced, and uh, she had been both those things since I was 10. And for a majority of my life, it had just been the two of us. Now, the reason I was living at home again was because Patty had recently been diagnosed as terminal, given six months to a year left to live, and she asked me to come home and help her through it. I said yes immediately and went home. But we made an agreement a pledge to each other when I first got home, and that was we were in this together, that she would do her best to treat me like an adult, and I would do my best not to act like a child. <laughs> the other thing that we decided we were going to do was that we were going to look at it like a job, a job with responsibilities attached to it, and my title was primary caregiver. And with that job title, I received $75 cash that I received every Friday Jealous? <laughs> For the first couple of months, I had two main responsibilities, each of them very different. The first responsibility was, Patty was a steadfast worker and wanted to work up until the last day that she possibly could. So, my first job responsibility was to drive her to work in the morning at 9, and then pick her up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which left me six hours to do with as I pleased. One thing I would do is I'd go to the gym, for a couple hours where I got in absolutely ridiculous shape. Or two, I would engage in my new hobby, one that I picked up while I was at home, one that I'm going to tell you now, completely and totally unapologetically. Scrapbooking. <laughs> I love it. I'm very, very good at it, and I find it therapeutic and rewarding. At the time, Patty and I used to joke that I could easily be described as a 35-year-old heterosexual male with the hobbies of a 75-year-old woman in the body of a 25-year-old gay man. <laughs> My second job responsibility was a little bit different, and it was this. <sighs> Patty had a rare form of cancer called a leiomyosarcoma which was a free-floating tumor that was making its way through her body, systematically shutting down her organs. To do this, it had to expend energy. Therefore, it had to expel a waste product, which was in the form of a liquid that would collect on her lungs throughout the day. Another one of my job responsibilities was every day at 7.30 in the morning, I would take a stent that was connected to the inside of her body, and I would hook it up to a vacuum, and I would drain all that fluid off of her lungs. The process took about 90 seconds, and we would get about a liter of fluid off each time. We had a signal that when she felt empty, she would raise her hand in the air, and then I would have to immediately close the valve. We were warned by the doctors that were either of us to miss this timing, all of the liquid would be gone, and then air would be violently sucked out of her lungs, and in her weakened state, she would have a heart attack and die in front of me. So for a few seconds every day, Patty's life was in my hands. Optimism was a full-time job. And I will be very candid with you. When I first got home, all I wanted to do was run as far away from this as I possibly could. It was too much for me to bear at some points. And then the thing that really made sense to me was when I realized that Patty could not run away from this either, that we were stuck. We couldn't do anything about it. And we just had to deal with it. But then one night, everything changed. We were watching the third season of The West Wing, and there was a quote that came on that caught her ear and left an indelible mark, and it became the cornerstone of how we looked at this entire thing. And the paraphrased quote is this. We all fall, 
and it matters. But when the fall is all you have left, it matters a great deal. This led us to have a lot of very honest discussions, one that, something that we had never really broached before, which was, what do you do when you know beyond a shadow of a doubt you're going to die? No ifs, ands, or buts about it. This is just your fate. Do you let that knowledge crush you and dictate your actions for your remaining days, or do you accept your fate? Do you embrace it? Do you do things that you want to do, holding your head high? I asked her, how do you want to go out? And she answered, I don't want to go out with a whimper. I do not want people feeling sorry for me. So that led me to one night suggest, what if we threw a party for you, like a grand bon voyage, where I would MC it and put on a performance, a tribute. And she loved the idea. And it was great for her because she loved the idea of being able to say goodbye to everyone in her life that meant something to her. And plus, as she said to me afterwards, and I quote, I will never get to see you get married or become a father. So this will just have to be the next best thing. But there was one thing holding her back before she would fully commit to this party. If Patty was here to describe herself, she would say that she was fiscally frugal. <laughs> but because she's not here to defend herself, she was a cheapskate who refused to spend money. <laughs> so the next day I went and did some pricing and I reported back to her that for us to have it at the venue that she wanted, it was going to cost us a minimum of $8,000. And she said, oh no, oh no. This was a really good idea, but no. I went away and I thought about it and I came back to her with this argument. I said, mom, you have the money. I'm about to inherit this money and this is how I would choose to spend it. Later that night, as I was sitting in my bedroom working on a very masculine scrapbook, <laughs> Patty stood in my doorway and she said, Kevin, my entire life I've been saving for the future. The future's now, isn't it? And I said, yeah, it is. And she said, okay, let's have this party. And at this point, planning began. Invitations went out. And this was such an exciting time for us because it gave us so much. It gave us something to talk about. It gave us something to plan for. And most importantly, it gave us something to look forward to because we desperately needed it. One night, while a little wine tipsy at dinner, we started playing a cute game together, which was we started confessing secrets to each other <laughs> because none of them mattered anymore because all the things that I had done in the past were simply just stops on the road that eventually led me to come home and help her. So if I ever had a free pass with my mother, this was it. So I told her all about in my tipsy way about how I stole beer from a grocery store that I used to work at when I was 16, how one time, a couple of years prior, I had jumped over a chain link fence and my shoelace got caught on the chain link and I fell on my face and it exploded and the doctor said, if you had just done it a half inch more, you'd have been blind. Or my favorite one was the comically dangerous drug transaction that I did on the streets of Vienna, Austria, but the only reason I got out of it safely was because one of the guys thought I looked like Chuck Norris. Patty and I were laughing, having a great time, and then she told me something that absolutely broke my heart. When she was 24 years old, Patty married my father. Never being one of the popular kids, Patty was nervous to have a wedding shower thrown in her honor. But her roommate at the time was also her maid of honor and said, don't you worry about it. it it's all going to be fine. We cut to the day of the wedding shower, and Patty, my grandmother, and the roommate sat in a sparsely decorated room for over an hour, and no one showed up. To a 24-year-old woman, this was a devastating and defining moment for her, because that night she confessed a fear that she had always had, which is, no one comes to my party. 
yeah. <laughs> so I knew at this point that this was no longer just a want, that this was a need, and this was something that I had to deliver for her. Like I said, she was a single mother and she had done so many selfless acts for me that I had no other choice than to repay this last one. So I doubled my efforts and I tried to contend with all the different factors that must be contended with as you are doing an event of this level, but there were so many things that I could not control. Five days before the party, her health takes a sharp turn and she has to be rushed to the hospital where I am told that she does not have much more time. Then relatives with opinions start coming in town. <laughs> and not everybody thought the idea for the party was awesome. There was one, her brother came and he said that you need to stop this party and cancel it because what you two are doing, and I quote, is morbid and completely inappropriate. But then Patty did something that I have never seen her do before. And that was she stood her ground against her brother and any other naysayer that she was going to have this party, that it was not going to be canceled. And she made me promise that it was going to go on with or without her. This was going to be her crowning moment and no one was going to step in her way. And you could either get on board or get out of the way. It was amazing to watch, but I know her really well, so let's be honest. She'd also spent 8,000 non-refundable dollars on this, <laughs> so there's no way she was going to cancel it. We cut to the day of the party. June 24th, 2006, 7 p.m., and I will never, ever forget this moment. We're in the beautiful Sawgrass Marriott Resort in lovely Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida, standing in front of the closed doors of Banquet Hall A. Patty is behind me in a wheelchair, and I cannot believe that we've made it to this point, and I'm exhausted. I've not slept in days. And I turn to her, and I touch her hand, and she gives my hand a reassuring squeeze. And I say to her, here we go. And I turn around, and I put my hands on the doors, and fueled only by adrenaline and two watered-down vodka cranberries, <laughs> I push the doors open and I walk in the room and I announce, ladies and gentlemen, Patty McGeehan. And the place goes wild. The piano player bursts into a rousing rendition of the West Wing theme. <laughs> and everyone who said they were going to be there had shown up. And all of them are on their feet, clapping wildly. And Patty McGeehan enters the room to her first and her last standing ovation. And it is magnificent to witness. The party goes spectacular. It was a wonderful night full of laughter, full of just pragmatic honesty. And aside from one small snafu that always happens in events of this size, where one guy thought it would be the best idea in the world to give an impromptu speech where he called Patty a MILF and then defined the acronym, <laughs> aside from that, the evening was as good, if not as better than we had hoped. At the end of the night, the culmination was a receiving line where Patty would get to say goodbye to everyone, but more importantly, everyone would get to say goodbye to her. And watching that receiving line from the outside, I can say with assurance that while there was sadness in the farewells, there was not one person in that room who felt sorry for her. At the end of the night, she called me over to her and she gestured for me to lean down and she kissed me on the cheek and she said, thank you, Kevin. This was so much better than my wedding shower. To which I responded, you're very welcome, but that one really wasn't hard to beat. <laughs> Eight days later, as I was holding her hand, she drew her final breath. Her last words to me were, you're a good man, Charlie Brown. There are many things I got to thank Patty for, specifically this party, which was as much of a gift for me as it was for her. I walked out of that house different than how I walked in and I truly believe it was for my betterment because I got to see Patty face her fears 
and I got to see her conquer them. And she showed me beyond a shadow of a doubt that no matter how much the chips may be stacked against you, that there is a way to hold your head high. Because when the fall was all she had left, she did it on her terms because it mattered a great deal. And to answer your next question, yes, I made a beautiful scrapbook of the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Kevin McGinn. Now, thanks, thanks to you, the entire Paramount Theater in Austin, Texas has shown up to Patty's party. <laughs> About another round of applause for Kevin McGinn. <laughs> and then, of course, once this goes out on the podcast and the radio, well, then a couple million people would have shown up at her party, which I think is really going to be awesome. 